Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Hande, for the introduction. Malik, thank you for the invitation. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge um, Anya Galaccio, Jean-Pierre Gorin, and Jennifer Pastor uh, for supporting and challenging me during my years here at UC, UCSD. I'd also like to thank a group of MFA and PhD cohorts that were an essential part of my education here. Uh, they are Adrian Garbini, Christopher Cardambikis, Jesse Harding, Rujeko Hockley, Sadie Barnett, Salar Mameni, and Tim Schwartz. Uh, ten years ago, in a building close to the one we're, uh, we're in tonight, I presented my MFA thesis show titled Drop Ceiling. Uh, the show consisted of a lecture performance and an architectural intervention that looked at the rise and fall of the Trans-Arabian Pipeline Company, an oil company uh, that operated between 1950 and 1983 in what is usually referred to as the Middle East. I did not know it then, but that work set the course for the next 10 years of my life and my work, and helped define my interests in objects, stories, and places, and the way they inform each other. Uh, so tonight, I'll be talking about the last 10 years of my life and my work uh, by looking at three multi-part, multi-year projects, three standalone works, and if we have time at the end, um, talk, uh, take an in-depth look at uh, the project that I developed for the 2022 Whitney Biennial that closed recently. So shortly after graduating from UCSD, I moved back to Beirut, which is where I'm from and where I grew up. And I started a, a series called The Shortest Distance Between Two Points, which was an extension of my MFA thesis and um, that looked basically at the, the history of this um, oil company that uh, operated uh, for about 33 years and then fell apart because it could not um, confront the contradictions of geopolitics. And so this oil company was developed uh, by a kind of agreement between Esso, Texaco, and Mobil. And the reasoning was that right after World War II, there was a need uh, for, uh, there was a need for fast and easy access uh, for oil uh, by the European and North American markets that led these three companies to join together and build the world's longest pipeline back then, which was 1,213 kilometers long, and it ran from Saudi Arabia to Lebanon and crossed the borders of Saudi, Jordan, Israel, Syria, and Lebanon. This company was operated, uh, and it kind of circumvented uh, the way oil used to be exported out of Saudi, which is by water, through three straits ending in the Mediterranean in order for it to end up to go to Europe and North America. So the plan of the pipeline was to actually circumvent that, create this seemingly straight line in what was thought to be abandoned land, and basically get it faster and cheaper. Uh, the pipeline was built and it operated until a series of, um, until basically you know, ge geopolitical events from the 1967 war to the 1973 war to the 1982 invasion rendered the pipeline extremely fragile and the company collapsed. And it's actually the first major oil kind of company to um, completely disintegrate. For me, when I was kind of working on it, I had always been interested in this idea of thinking of the political dimension of geometry and also the political dimension of infrastructure and thinking through uh, what happens to these pieces of infrastructure, to, the, to these objects when they lose their function. And so uh, what happens to this, to this pipeline when it now lives more as an empty vessel than it did as a, a piece of infrastructure. And so I started kind of developing a series of works that kind of think through or kind of imagine kind of potentials 
to this um, to this pipeline, but also to this company beyond its uh, its functional use. Um, I was also really intrigued by the fact that this object could do something that people could not. So it's a, it's the only physical object that crosses the borders of five political entities that not only are. Uh, at war with each other, but basically it can do something that people cannot, right? So it goes through these, um, these you know, uh, borders, it kind of cuts through uh, politics and um, could be reimagined as um, either a piece of land art, but also kind of thinking through it as this abstract form, this alien form that's kind of landed in this... Um, uh, in this landscape. Um, so I've developed a series of works kind of thinking through this material. One of them is this series called Steel Rings, which is an attempt at remaking the entire pipeline at one-to-one -one scale, but in kind of these 10 centimeter sections. So it's basically the original pipeline was about 31 inches in diameter and 6 uh, millimeters in thickness and, like I said, 1,213 kilometers in length. And so this kind of piece um, uh, kind of reimagines this pipeline uh, as kind of in sections. So each time I'm invited to show this work, I produce another section of, of the pipeline and each of these sections is engraved with a longitude, a latitude, Whoa. What's that? There we go. With like the coordinates of um, how far you are from the, you know, from Saudi uh, and the coordinates uh, where it is, which is also kind of a reflection on. So this was like a multinational company with headquarters in California, in New York, in The Hague, in Lebanon, in Saudi, in Jordan. And uh, um, we, it ha I think at the height of its operation, they had like 50,000 employees that spoke 40 different languages. And so in a way, in order to circumvent having to uh, deal even with like the names of locations along the pipeline, there was this kind of very simple numerical system that was devised to identify sections of it. And for me, it's kind of, part of the, the failure of this project or kind of thinking about this project as a complete kind of um, uh, um, contradiction, right, between the abstraction of oil ex extraction and infrastructural project and basically the land on which these objects sit. Uh, and so for me, kind of this idea of, of working with the, the coordinates as a way to re, um, to bring back, sorry, the, the geography back into these kind of rather minimal, simple sculptural forms. Um, and this piece has kind of been shown in different contexts, and I've al I'm always kind of very intrigued and constantly surprised by the way it kind of really either relate or, or kind of confront different also architectures, right? So um, whether it is kind of uh, white cube space, um, as shown here in a show in London, or a more kind of like particular uh, architecture, um, as shown here in the Sharjah Art Museum, uh, on the High Line in New York, in a music conservatory in Venice, or even when the pipeline somehow returns home, uh, as shown here in the desert of Al Aula in, in Saudi Arabia. And so it's kind of this um, kind of working through this idea of a form that's abstract enough that it can um, kind of both hold all this history and this material, but at the same time also transform or change based on the, the context in which it's, it's shown. And I think it's this tension that for me had always been really interest that I had always been interested in, particularly with this story of this, this company, but kind of in general, like how can we consider or think of these um, uh, you know, objects or forms both as a result, of, obviously, of their um, 
uh, their history, but also what happens when we encounter them completely out of context and in a way also sometimes completely out of, out of history. Um, in the same kind of series, I did this kind of work called Three Logos that looked at, so as part of the, the deal that, was, that, uh, that took place between this kind of American conglomerate and the countries in which the pipeline passed through, there was like a monopoly of uh, Esso, Mobil, and uh, uh, Caltex in building and operating uh, gas stations throughout the Arab world. And so, you know, in this period of 33 years, these kind of uh, very um, uh, visually, so the logos of these companies became very visually present in the, in the landscape. Um, after the kind of fall of the company in 83, the monopoly was lifted. But even to this day, when you're kind of driving in kind of back roads in Jordan or Saudi or, or Lebanon, you kind of come across these disheveled gas stations, and most of what's left of them are these logos. So this piece, in a way, reimagined that encounter by remaking at one-to-one -one scale these kind of gas station logos, but simply just removing the, um, the name of the companies from the logos. And so, you know, we still live in a, in a world or in a condition where uh, some of us might um, look at the logo and kind of remember uh, or identify it with certain kind of companies, but I think soon we'll enter a reality where that will not be the case. And then I'm kind of really interested in, I had always been interested in this company also as a foreshadowing mechanism, that it's both looking at the past, but kind of like projecting us into the future, where we'll confront, we're, we're confronting again these objects that have both, uh, we kind of understand what they are, but also there's a certain uh, type of estrangement that happens with our encounter with them, right? So a red star can also have other meanings, or a blue oval, or even kind of this like Pegasus um, logo. Um, the last piece from the series that I'll talk about is this called um, Letterheads, which, um, so as part of my, so a lot of these projects are multi-year, involved a lot of kind of research, their journeys where I'm not always sure what I kind of end up with. And along the way, you know, I, encounters, I encounter something that kind of changes the course of the project. And something happened halfway through my research on this company where I was given access to the abandoned headquarters of the company in Beirut that had been left sitting, again, abandoned since 1983. And it was this kind of massive seven-story building where every, it seemed like, you know, uh, workers had just left one day and then it had just been kind of preserved under, you know, when I encountered it in 2009, it had just sat there for all these years accumulating dust. And so in the middle of processing all this material from telexes and faxes and uh, photos and plans and furniture and all of that, I came across a desk that just had a stack of, um, and you know, a lot of content, right, a lot of information and history and data. And so on the desk was just like a pile of 500 sheets of blank uh, papers that just had the, the letterhead of the, of the company, both in English and in Arabic. And out of all this chaos, I chose to basically um, take just that stack of paper and um, think uh, about how much that material not only holds the record of the history of this company, but also speaks to this um, almost um, contradiction that's at the center of the story, which is basic, I mean, it's very simple. Uh, because this was an American company, all their material was produced in the U.S. following U.S. standards. So their paper was actually 8.5 by 11 format. Uh, but Lebanon and most of the Arab world uses the like A4 DIN formats. And so for me, like that juxtaposition and contradiction is at the center of the, you know, the, the larger contradiction of the project. And so this piece is actually quite simply an A4 frame that an eight and a half and 11 sheet of paper is shoved into. And uh, it kind of like the tension that's in between those two for me kind of holds a lot of the tension that's at the center of this project. Um, and kind of as I was working on this project, I had actually also began another 10 year long project called 
Five Distant Memories, The Suitcase, The Room, The Toys, The Boat, and Maradona, which is a project that um, looked at uh, the... My, I, it was like in, I was interested in investigating or locating my earliest memory. And while I was trying to go through this exercise, I realized that I have five memories that I cannot place which one came first. And they are, I remember uh, keeping a packed suitcase at the side of my bed for an eventual evacuation. I remember uh, standing in the doorway of my bedroom that had disappeared. I remember keeping a set of woodblock toys with me at all, all times. I remember uh, being on a boat with my parents. And I remember um, hearing on the radio that Maradona had scored the goal against England. And... Um, this project was kind of an attempt to exorcise some of these uh, memories. And also what was really interesting to me is that these memories were intimately tied with five objects. And so the, the, the plan or the idea was to start reimagining these objects or reconfiguring, uh, remaking some of them um, as maybe transformed or troubled or changed by these memories or by these stories. And this kind of investigation of the relationship between kind of objects and memories, objects and stories, but also kind of my, what I later realized was kind of my um, obsession with thinking about like an objective um, uh, history as opposed to a subjective history, right? So kind of a, a history through objects as opposed to a history through, through people. Um, so the, the series, um, uh, yeah, so sorry, one of the works, the first work in the series was this piece called Fossils, where I would ask people to give me um, suitcases that, you know, they didn't want anymore, and I would fill them with uh, material that's needed for uh, kind of an, an, an evacuation, and I would dip them in concrete. So they're kind of direct casts uh, onto these kind of suitcases, and... Um, and yeah, kind of, I would just let them, let them, uh, you know, become solid. And I did that for about ten years, over the course of which I've made about a hundred of these. Um, the next kind of piece in that series is a piece called 1989, which uh, remakes the volume of my bedroom in Beirut uh, in canvas. So it's kind of a one-to-one -one replica of um, the bedroom I grew up in, uh, and it's kind of held uh, by a door and a window frame uh, that was cut out of the of, of said bedroom. And so this kind of thinking through, uh, again, these moments where um, kind of memory, recollection, and kind of these objects suddenly, you know, we enter this almost surreal world, right, where like rooms are malleable or kind of, you know, suitcases become solid. Like it's kind of a very, as much as it is kind of planned and studied and, and, and um, accurately, let's say, executed, there's also kind of in the series a lot of, um, in a way, moments of surprise, right, of moments of, of kind of leaps of imagination. And what was also really interesting to me in in here, but I would say generally in my work to think about this idea of the one-to-one -one scale, right? So, and thinking of sculpture in our own scale, right? As opposed to like something that's smaller than us or something that's bigger than us. How can you make something that's like at our scale seem strange and unfamiliar, right? With a shift in material, with a change of, you know, the way we perceive the object or we encounter it. And so it's kind of that's, I would say that this series really helped me kind of get at a lot of uh, of, the, of those questions. The third piece in that, in the series, is a piece called Architecture Lessons, which is um, 35,000 uh, concrete replicas of this set of wood block toys that we see a couple of pieces of uh, that I had as a child. Uh, so again, you know, that set of wood block toys is, you know, this big. And then as I just kind of keep replicating it and replicating it and ended up with kind of like these thousands of pieces that, you know, when displayed, again, on the floor, take over a whole space. And so when you consider the, the, 
the set of toys by itself, your relationship, you know, the relationship of the viewer to the object is rather kind of a more dominant one. But once kind of this object gets replicated, gets kind of disseminated, it can really take over these rather large spaces and set you as a viewer in a completely different, almost kind of um, foreboding kind of position. Um, the next part and piece in this project is called Cyprus, and it looked at this memory that I had of being on a boat with my, with my parents, which uh, soon after, actually, I moved back in, in 2012, I invited my parents out to dinner in the north of the country at their favorite fish restaurant, and halfway through the dinners, my parents started arguing about whether or not a boat that was um, on the shore behind us uh, whether or not they had rented the boat, that the exact boat that was on the shore behind us 25 years earlier in a failed attempt to escape to Cyprus, which is a story that my parents had never told my sister and I. But soon after, we kind of like w investigated the history of that boat and discovered, you know, found the son of the owner because the owner had died and then he looked at my parents and he's like, oh yeah, I remember you guys. You're that crazy family that tried to escape to Cyprus. And if you'll ever meet my dad, he's rather short and stocky and he would have killed us had he attempted that escape. So merely half an hour after that attempt, we came back to shore. And again, I mean, the contradiction for me with that story is that my sister and I remember it as kind of a regular day in the sun at the beach on a boat with my parents. And the kind of the other side of that is, is kind of this escape where the water and the unknown seems safer than, than what's known. Um, so through these conversations, I was able to acquire this boat. And I had been kind of thinking of how to think through this, this not only this memory, but you know, what to do with this, with this object. And I um, started um, thinking a lot about kind of physics, about weight, about transference of weight, and you know, primarily my dad's inability to successfully get us to Cyprus had to do with basically these two bodies that um, where the weight of one was much greater than the other, and so I started. I discovered, you know, in you know, not discovered, but in you know, basic physics, every time you add a pulley, you can divide the weight of an object by half. And so I worked with these uh, incredible pulley makers in Belgium that make complex pulleys for the moving of rather large objects. And um, the whole kind of thinking about this, uh, behind this, this, this piece was to basically make a 19 pulleys that would divide the weight of this 850 kilogram boat by 19 so that its anchor, that's only 60 kilograms, could hold it in perfect balance. So this is, these are two objects that are actually in perfect balance with each other that are, that are you know, where one is holding the other and one is you know, much greater in weight than the other. And so again, it's kind of this moment where like the pulley right, becomes the center of the, um, the way in which the story gets transferred. Right? And the last piece in this, uh, in this series is called um, La Mano de Dios, which uh, looks at this, which is a modified uh, radio transmitter. Um, so I grew up only listening to the radio. You know, there's always the radio turned on at a specific channel. Uh, uh, during the, the civil war in Lebanon, there's this kind of one um, uh, anchor person on, on the radio that was really close with different um, mi militias and would get kind of intelligence information from each of them as to which area was going to be bombed. And he basically would um, come up on this very specific radio frequency and shortly before an imminent bombing would, uh, you know, kind of play a siren and tell people who were living in certain areas to evacuate. And he's kind of, um, you know, he's a very important figure because he also saved a lot of people's lives. And so... Almost every household in Lebanon during the war had a radio that's playing that channel. And there's a very kind of infamous moment where in 1986, during the quarterfinal, he was also an avid football player and, um, and uh, obsessed with, with Diego Maradona. 
And so in, in 1986, during the quarterfinal of uh, the World Cup that was taking place in Mexico City, there's a famous game that took place between England and uh, Argentina. And in that game, uh, Diego Maradona scored the goal with his hand, which is illegal, but the goal was counted. And it became kind of a very famous moment in football history. Uh, but also, I remember it because Sharif Lakhawe, that uh, anchor man, actually played the siren. He was watching the game. He played the siren, and he announced on the radio that Maradona had scored the goal against England. And all of a sudden, there was this kind of like weird transference that happened where all of us who remember that moment were lifted out of whatever was happening, uh, you know, during uh, that day or month or year, and were kind of transported to the, to the, to the field in Mexico City. And, I mean, the game itself has all these political connotations because it came, I mean, I learned that only years later, that it came shortly after the Falkland Wars, right, that pinned England against uh, Argentina. And um, it was kind of considered this kind of victory of, of Argentina over England, but not on the war front, but in, you know, in a game. And so the piece is rather simple. It's a, it's a modern, you know, I took the my parents' radio transmitter, and I modified it so that it only plays on repeat the um, Argentinian commentator describing the goal as it happens, followed by a, a British commentator describing the same goal. And they just kind of play on repeat on this, on this radio transmitter. Um, so this, like I said, so kind of like this series was kind of a form of like exorcism, a form of kind of going through uh, not only my the kind of these childhood memories, but also kind of working out a lot of these interests or questions around again object making, found objects. Can we kind of tell stories through object? What's the adequate balance between how much material or information do you give to the audience? How much do you keep to yourself? And really thinking about these, uh, yeah, again as like um, remade, ready mades. Um, so at the end of that 10-year journey, I, by complete accident, in 2016, I was invited to spend a year uh, doing artist residency in Berlin uh, with the DAAD. And so I had just kind of finished this, this uh, series and, quite frankly, didn't really know what I wanted to work on. Uh, but so right before kind of moving to Berlin, I had helped my parents empty my grandparents' apartment in Beirut. And while emptying the, the, that, that, that apartment, I came across a series of correspondences, photographs um, uh, between my great-grandfather and um, a strange and interesting character known, uh, uh, called Max von Oppenheim, and a book written in German, a language nobody in my family um, knew. And I had heard of kind of Max von Oppenheim because his portrait was always hanging on uh, in the dining room of my, my grandparents' uh, apartment, but nobody could really tell me more about who this guy was, what was he doing in our, you know, dining room. And I was like, he's German, I'm going to Germany, maybe I can just take this material and then, like, figure something out. Uh, very soon after um, moving to Berlin, I discovered that Max von Oppenheim had um, been this kind of amateur archaeologist that in the, at the turn of the last century discovered this rather now important archaeological site called Tal Halaf, which is, sits today on the border between Syria and Turkey. And um, so I was like, okay, where is the material that, you know, he brought back with him from Syria, learned that it was at the Pergamon Museum. And so I just wrote this rather innocent email to like, I think, info at pergamon.de, where it's like, to whom it may concern, like, my name is Rayan Tabit. I didn't even tell them I was an artist. I was like, I have some material from this dig, from photographs, if I can just talk to anybody that's willing to talk to me. And a week later, I found myself in a room with two uh, archaeologists that I think changed 
my whole life. So Nadia Kolidis and Lutz Martin were these two, are these two incredible scholars and archaeologists who had worked on um, the site of Tal Halaf, which I'll get to in a second. But so I go to meet them, these strangers, and they're kind of rather, you know, cold and distant because they're like, who are you? What are you doing here? Like, and then I showed them these, I had like 10 photos of my great-grandfather on the dig. And they look at me and they're like, we've been waiting for you. I was like, what? What are you talking about? They're like, you know, in all the photos that we have, which are many hundreds of photos of the dig, this man is standing in the background and we don't know what his name is, we don't know who he is, we don't know what he's doing there. And in the photos that I have, the same man is in the foreground of these photographs. So, and this man happens to be my, to be my great-grandfather. So, and they're like, okay, what the fuck? Like, who are you? What's happening? And uh, so it turns out, basically, my great-grandfather had worked on this dig for six months as Max von Oppenheim's personal translator and secretary. Uh, in parallel, my great-grandfather had actually been sent from Beirut by the authorities of the French Mandate, which um, were then stationed in Lebanon and Syria, to actually spy on Max von Oppenheim, because the French were suspecting that von Oppenheim was not actually an archaeologist, but was inciting the Bedouin tribes around Tel, Tel Halaf for a possible coup against colonial powers. And so my great-grandfather's job was to spy on a possible spy. He spent six months on this dig, um, did kind of his job as a secretary, and would send back reports to, um, to the French stationed in Lebanon. Uh, after, you know, the, he was never able to like find anything on Max, whether that's true or not, we don't really know. But what happened is that Max and my great-grandfather stayed in touch after the dig ended, and that was kind of reflected in these correspondences. And then later on, when Max published a book on this dig, he sent it to my great-grandfather, which then made it to um, our, our library. So I was like, okay, now what do I do with this? Through my kind of... So I started basically like interviewing Nadia and Lutz, and they're like, I was like, what, you know, tell me more about this dig, tell me more about this person, what's going on here? And soon I found myself in the middle of this complex and contradictory story of, um, you know, colonial powers and archaeological artifacts and transfers of objects and destructions of museums and and buildings of museums. And I, one of maybe the most fascinating story is that, so when Max ended his excavation, as a result of partage, which is the way archeological artifacts were divided between the person doing the dig and the authorities of the land on which a dig was uh, taking place, he got half of what he discovered and France got the other half, right? Because even though the, the dig was taking place in Syria, it was under French mandate. So the French basically took the other half. When he returned back to Berlin with his half, he tried to donate it to the Pergamon Museum, which back then was not interested in what they deemed a secondary civilization, which are the Hittites. And so he's like, okay, I'm the son of a rich banker. I'll open my own museum. So in 1930, he opened his own museum in Berlin called the Tel Halaf Museum. And during, um, you know, 15 years later, during the Allied bombings of, of Berlin, um, his museum was targeted and everything that he had brought back with him was destroyed. Um, he went back to the museum, gathered these 27,000 fragments, and went back to the Pergamon and said, I have to evacuate. Could you just hold these fragments for me until I come back? So the Pergamon puts these, you know, crates in storage. He leaves, dies a year later in Dresden, and then Berlin is divided in half, right? It's cut in half. The family, Oppenheim family, is on the west side. The museum is on the east side. So nothing can be done with these fragments until the reunification of Germany in 1990 when 
Nadia and Lutz, as two young archaeologists, were assigned to go in the vaults of the Pergamon and build back this 27,000-piece puzzle, which took them 15 years to do. After these 15 years, they were left with 1,000 unidentified objects that they know come from these um, kind of this material, but they cannot place them back within the sculptures. And so they were kind of left with this dilemma, which is both a philosophical dilemma and an art historical one. They can't really put them on display, but they can't really do anything, kind of, they can't throw them away. Uh, so that's the kind of philosophical dilemma. The art historical one is that usually in archaeology, you date an object from the outside in, right? So something is like Greek and Roman because it has certain features, it has certain kind of qualities. Even though they knew that these objects came from this kind of Neo-Hittite civilization, which is about 3,000 years uh, old, they could no longer date them as such. So they had to say that these are most probably from a 3,000-year-old sculpture. They, but sorry, in dating, they also had to acknowledge that the ob so the, sorry, the only way they could now date the object is geologically, which is to say, this object is made from basalt, which is you know three million years old. But at the same time, they had to acknowledge that the fact that these had become exposed during the bombing of Berlin in 1945, they had also to acknowledge in the dating of this object that they had tried to reconstruct it over a period of 15 years and failed. And so suddenly, these 1,000 basically objects had, were at the same time 3 million years old, 3,000 year old, from 1945, and attempted to be reconstructed over a period of 15 years. And when they told me this, I was like, this is it. This is, the project lies in this complete, absurd contradiction, right, between heritage preservation, the continuous kind of moments of violence. After I started this project at the height of the Syrian civil war, where all that you could hear on the news was the kind of imminent destruction of Palmyra, but there was at the same time no um, acknowledgement of other forms of destructions that have happened historically, not only in you know, Syria, Iraq, uh, Libya, but also in somewhere like uh, Berlin, right? Or Paris, or even New York. And so I was kind of really interested in how the story of the site could trouble some of these kind of assumptions as to where kind of heritage is left kind of safe. And so I, for very selfish reasons, wanted to touch these 1,000 objects. And so I had to find a reason to touch these 1,000 objects. And so I put in a request to make charcoal rubbings of every single one of these objects. So I was allowed to spend one minute with each of these objects. I would wrap every piece of stone with a piece of paper, and then I would just kind of rub it with, with a charcoal stick. And I kind of developed this work that's made out of, that kind of reconstructs the, these kind of 1,000 unidentified fragments and puts them at the center stage, um, which, interestingly enough, was, uh, you know, for Nadia and Lutz, they're like, we worked really hard to build those things together. Don't you want to do something with the things we rebuilt? I was like, no, I'm really interested just in in your, the failure of your project. Um, similarly, another kind of, so I, in a way, sorry, so that kind of started this whole, I would say, rabbit hole of re-excavating, mining the story, and finding within it all these moments, all these contradictions that for me are also um, kind of great kind of, they have great, sorry, sculptural potentials, or they kind of re, kind of, for me, make me reimagine or reconsider kind of, again, object making, issues of preservation, temporality, um, uh, and, and material, right? Like the history of materials. So this is another piece from the series called Ah, My Beautiful Venus, where I was one of the main objects kind of excavated and reconstructed uh, from Tel Halaf is kind of the seated uh, grave, yard marker uh, that up until today it's a figure that um, with it was discovered with no marking it's kind of this massive six and a half ton of carved basalt and uh, since there was no inscription on it there's no idea if this was a male or female figure there's no idea what this figure was doing we don't know if it's a if it's a deity we don't know if it's a 
lay person. It's just kind of this very obscure figure that becomes, uh, takes center stage not only in Max's narrative, but keeps on being, I mean, has become, sorry, over, over the years a really important artifact from this day. And so through um, working with, with these two conservators, I was kind of given access to the, um, the parts of this uh, sculpture that were kind of made it human, so the hands, the face, the hair, and I was able to make these uh, kind of foil pressings of, of these pieces. And um, while working on this, uh, on this project, I was also really interested in basalt, as, uh, the, 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 which, is the material, which is this kind of dark stone that most of these objects had been made of. Uh, and I was able to find the quarry that uh, the, st the material, um, sorry, the, the, the Telhath material had been quarried from, which 3,000 years later was still operating and was the last, op and happened to be the last operating basalt quarry in Syria. And so in 2000, and I think, yeah, 17 or 18, when I was invited to show this work, um, the idea was to quarry a six and a half ton block of basalt from that quarry in Syria and kind of have it confront this, you know, kind of these fragments of a statue uh, that I was able to remake. Uh, back then and still today, there's an embargo on goods coming from Syria, so I could not ship a six and a half ton block of basalt from it. We had to cut it in tiles, ship it clandestinely to Lebanon with this idea that I was like retiling a kitchen in Lebanon, and then illegally exported from Lebanon to Europe and then wherever it would, uh, it would go on to, to be shown. And so in a way that's when this kind of block of basalt actually became a floor and it became the base on which not only these um, pieces stand but you as a viewer actually can move around on it. And, and a, com a companion piece of this, of this work is uh, charting just the official paperwork that this block of basalt had to take in order to get to wherever you're looking at it. So wherever this work is, whenever this work is shown, there's always, so it starts in Syria, moves to Lebanon, moves to, I think this is in Rotterdam, then Hamburg, then Sharjah. So whenever it kind of, you add these paperwork, and those paperwork for me are not just kind of these bureaucratic material to move material through uh, this, uh, these borders, but they're also a reflection of a journey that, it, uh, in a very perverse way, uh, materials can take that, that people cannot. At the center of this um, story, of course, is the, the story of my great-grandfather, and I learned while working on this project that um, in 1929, shortly before leaving Tal Halaf, um, and returning back to Beirut, my great-grandfather was given um, a goat hair rug um, that had been woven by the Bedouins of, of Tel Halaf. Uh, it measured about 20 meters long and one meter wide. In 1983, before he passed away, my great-grandfather had no money or things to kind of leave behind, so his will was this that this 20 meter rug be cut in five pieces so that each of his children would get a piece with the, uh, with the idea that each child should cut their piece among their children and so on and so forth until one day the rug eventually will disappear. And so this piece kind of re, kind of imagines my maternal lineage, my kind of the genealogy on my mother's side by loaning back all the pieces of this rug that has been now divided across five generations and about, I think, 13 pieces. And so whenever I can kind of have a loan, there's the actual piece of rug that's on display. And whenever somebody refuses for a variety of reasons to loan their piece, there's kind of like this, this kind of linen standalone. For me, in a way, this work also is like a perfect, uh, um, fusion of the two sides of my brain, kind of this uh, 
the power of these kind of narratives and stories and oral histories and also that's confronted with kind of my training as an architect, my interest in kind of like minimal conceptual, post-conceptual works, and kind of the possibility for these two worlds to somehow meet, interact, and take over each other. This piece is also kind of, was, I would say, my kind of first major foray or imagination into kind of lectures, performances, as a way to also imagine the story itself as kind of a standalone work. And so this piece is called, so I've kind of done these, um, I would call them either guided tours, lecture performances, whatever you want to call it, where I kind of recount the story in different ways depending on the, on the setting. Uh, and sometimes I kind of use props, and sometimes I kind of do it inside, you know, the, the you know, museums where I'm, was not able to do kind of an intervention is so it's kind of like it becomes this idea of thinking of the story not only as an integral part of this project but as a way to in and of itself have you know what sorry what's the the to challenge or think about the form that these stories can take and how they actually act in and of themselves as kind of a series of found kind of objects and found stories that are kind of collaged together while working on this project, I, and maybe the most kind of um, um, complicated part of this project was um, uh, realizing that um, in 1929, uh, when um, Max finished his excavation at Tel Halaf, he had discovered a frieze that was made out of 200 stone slabs that alternated between black basalt and red painted limestones that showed kind of scenes from, from daily life. So this frieze that was kind of quite massive um, over the course of a hundred years ended up being um, divided between, I have to look at my notes, the Louvre Museum in Paris, the British Museum in London, the Metropolitan Museum in New York, the Walters Museum in Baltimore, the National Museum in Aleppo, the Deir Zor Museum in the north of Syria. Some were destroyed uh, throughout successive wars in Europe and the Middle East, and some have disappeared. And so I was really kind of intrigued by the story of this, in my opinion, one object that ends up kind of being completely fragmented and decontextualized in all these, for the most part, encyclopedic museums. And so I started approaching each of the institutions that holds in their collection some of these objects and asked to basically, once again, touch these objects, which is to put in a request to make charcoal rubbings of, uh, of, of these stone slabs. So for conservation reason, I was only allowed to make rubbings of the basalt uh, pieces, and not all the museums were co you know, cooperated. So as of today, I was able to make 32 rubbings out of these 200 pieces from four major institutions. And during the course of this journey, uh, so sorry, this journey led me to um, work closely with Kim Benzel, who's now the curator in charge of the ancient Near East department at the Metropolitan Museum, who then invited me to actually do a show at the Met that focuses on the history of these four stone slabs that ended up in their collection. And they ended up in their collection through a very um, twisted, often unspoken a story that took place during World War II in the U.S. So in 19, at the, at the beginning of World War II, um, there was an act that took place called the Alien Property Custodian Act that uh, spec uh, stipulated that um, objects belonging to U.S. enemies on U.S. soil could be requisitioned and put up for auction. And so back in the 1930s, Max von Oppenheim had been short on cash after opening his own museum, so he brought eight of these reliefs to the U.S. to try and sell them to museums. He arrived shortly after the stock market crash. You know, nobody had money, and he's like, okay, I brought these gigantic things here, and I can't, don't know what to do with them. So he left them in a storage space in New Jersey and went back to Berlin. Fifteen years later, the alien property custodian police went into that storage, requisitioned these objects, put them up for auction, and that's how the Met bought all eight of them and resold four of them to the Walters Museum. 
And that's part of the story that's never talked about when you go see these four innocent objects in a corner in the ancient Near East departments. The, whole, the only part of that story that's told is that you know, these were excavated by Max von Oppenheim. They come from a 3th century BC temple. Um, so I was kind of really interested to work intimately with the institution to bring out that story and try to confront that story with, in a way, this parallel, much more personal uh, story of my great-grandfather. And the moment where, you know, to think about what happens when these two um, entities kind of collapse. Um, so part of the, the presentation was, uh, for example, including this archival material, which is how the Met came to buy, so the acquisition documents, which I did not know it, but the Met has never shown an acquisition document in public for legal reasons. So only to make this vitrine with four pieces of paper in it took a year of back and forth uh, conversation with counsel, uh, because basically everything becomes a precedent. So the whole conversation was like, even though these were legally obtained, um, what happens when you make legal documents available to the public? And then does that mean that that sets a precedent for other objects to have to be confronted with the documents, you know, their acquisition documents? And kind of in parallel with that, we had another vitrine that kind of had the personal material from my great-grandfather's collection between, you know, his portrait, the portrait of Max, some of the correspondences, and this book that actually is identical to this other book that was in the collection of the Met. And so for me, it's kind of this incredible moment where these two, you know, if we just consider this yellow book, there's, you know, hundreds of copies of it, but then one ends up in this kind of private living room in Beirut, and the other one ends up at the Watson Library at the Met, and then they each kind of embody whatever kind of conditions and contradictions that lie within them, and then there's a, and what happens when, you know, kind of they meet. Um, because this, so this, uh, this show took over three galleries in the ancient Near East department, and one of them is called the Court of Assyrian Relief, which is, uh, you know, one of, one of the main galleries in the, in, the, uh, in the museum, and it's a gallery that usually is left empty. There's just like a, a bench in the middle where people kind of can look at this Court of Assyrian Relief that comes from Nimrud, which is a site in Iraq. And so through the, the help of the men, we were able to loan back the seated figure, uh, which is this object that's now at the Pergamon Museum in Berlin, and place it at the center of this room that didn't, has never had an object placed inside of it. Uh, I was really interested not only in that kind of institutional um, first time, but also in this idea of, of uh, confronting, you know, these two uh, materials uh, with each other. And also what's, for me, really interesting, in particularly the, the um, reconstruction job, is that all these objects coming from Tel Halaf were reconstructed in a way that all their break marks, their scars, molten... Um, lava from the ceiling of the museum, all this glass was left exposed on the surface of these objects, which is something that's very rarely done in, in archaeological restoration. And so I was kind of also really interested in kind of people's confronting this object, which, again, you would think at first that you're looking at an object that's coming from Syria, right, that has kind of gone through the, the, the that is the reflection of that disaster, but then when you read the, the label, when you come closer to the object, you actually realize that it's a reflection of another conflict and another kind of moment. And the last kind of part or room in this was this kind of the display of these 32 charcoal rubbings um, that kind of I was able to make throughout these, um, uh, my journey through these kind of institutions. And I'll just kind of end by just hinting at a project. So as much as this project was so much, again, about kind of this family history, and by extension, the, the history of this archaeological dig, as part of my research, I came across this really kind of um, complicated moment in, um, because, you know, as much as Max von Oppenheim was an archaeologist, he was actually gathering intelligence information for the, the, German, the German military by making... 
uh, maps of the movement of Bedouins in summer and winter as a way to kind of think about a different way of thinking about the region for possible military deployment. These maps would later be used by uh, Rommel in his attack of North Africa. Another information that Max relayed to the German military was that he discovered that Bedouins um, have a specific design for jackets that can be turned into tents if they find themselves stranded in the desert. So this material was relayed to the German military that developed these specific type, they're called single soldier tents, that are actually exact replicas of these jackets that can be again, turned into tents if a soldier finds themselves uh, stranded in a battlefield. That information was then relayed from the German to the French, from the French to the Russians, from the Russians to the uh, US military. And so these are seven typologies of single soldier tents that have been used over a period of 100 years in ground offensives by the German, the French, the Russians, and the American uh, military in their attacks in North Africa, the Levant, and the Gulf. Um, so this kind of moment where I, you know, I kind of say this sentence all the time and it kind of haunts me to this day, it's as if you kind of give somebody the tools for your subjugation, right, kind of unintentionally finding your own damn jacket kind of used uh, against you. Um, and that moment then triggered another series that I will not talk about because I will be here for six more hours. Um, I'm going to try and wrap this up. But So I tend to work very serially over the course of multiple years, but I kind of wanted to show you quickly kind of three examples of projects that I would call are more standalone. They're much shorter in time. They kind of relate to um, kind of, again, encounters, accidents, and kind of I quickly kind of make something out of it. This piece called The Dead Sea in Three Parts is the result of this um, encounter I had in Jordan with these uh, geologists that were um, trying to measure the volume of water that was constant, because, you know, so the Dead Sea is this kind of body of water that's constantly shrinking, and you had these kind of geologists in Jordan try to make these 3D models of the volume of water. And I met them on kind of one of these artists' residency. And I was kind of really interested in thinking about this, the sculptural quality of this volume of water. At the same time, um, I had always been kind of haunted by the UN partition plan for Palestine, which is the 1947 UN decision for the division of Palestine. And something that's rarely talked about is that as part of this partition plan, um, the Dead Sea was also divided in three parts. So a third was given to Israel, a third was given to Jordan, and a third was given to Palestine. And so as a, just a very simple, almost cheeky exercise in form, I just wanted to see what happens to this object if I divide it along the UN partition plan. And that's when I discovered that actually the lowest point of the Dead Sea falls entirely in Jordan. So technically Jordan is the only place that can hold itself up, and then these two other kind of parts just kind of fall onto the ground. Um, kind of similarly, there's this kind of a series of, of, of projects that look also at kind of like architectural legacy, the moments, again, the, the history of materials. This is a project that looks at um, this, the history of a, one, a particular 19th century villa in Beirut that was clandestinely destroyed by the developer uh, who wanted to build the tallest skyscraper in Beirut on that same site. And so I was able to recuperate the marble columns from that 19th century villa and then got in touch with the developer and asked to keep, to I would buy back the concrete. So when you're building kind of these skyscrapers, you have to keep a record of every batch of concrete that's used in the structure of the building. And so basically five years later, I was able to kind of bring together uh, these kind of marble columns that once held the roof of that house and have them confront these um, 200 concrete cylinders that were then used to build this kind of new, new structure. Um, similarly and very quickly, another kind of exorcism moment of my 
past life as a as an architect came with the commission that I was given at the at the Walker Art Center, where I kind of developed this project that looks at um, the largest IBM factory in the world, which was in Rochester, Minnesota, and uh, it's a factory that in re I mean in shut down in 2018. And as IBM moves completely from making hardware to making software, and now from making software to investing most of their money in artificial intelligence. And so I was kind of really interested in this kind of, as the company moves into a dematerialized kind of state, uh, these, um, what happens to this building? And it so happens that this building had been designed in 1958, by Aero Saarinen, which is a very important architect, but also all the interiors had been done by Charles and Ray Eames. So it's also kind of this moment where this um, corporate, uh, this corporation kind of had embraced architecture and design as an integral part of its kind of messaging, but then in a way confront that with what happens when these kind of become leftovers. And so again, through a crazy, set of coincidences I was able to buy back from a tertiary market the leftovers of the auditorium of that building, which are these chair parts, um, these Eames chair parts, um, and kind of reconstructed the auditorium inside one of the galleries at the Walker. And what they're looking at is basically a, a, a cycle of 10 blue hues, uh, which back in 1958, um, Paul Rand, the graphic designer, had been invited by IBM to redesign their corporate identity, and he basically set the standard for these ten, spe ten specific shades of blue that uh, still today govern the identity of this company. And so in a way it was kind of this crazy deconstructed kind of cinema and the middle of all of that, I collaborated with IBM to develop an artificial intelligence voice that sounds like me, that retells the story of all these damn parts. Do we still have time to talk about the Becoming American or not? Because <laughs> I can also end. Um, you know, we have, uh, I think, 20 minutes. So okay. We should, you know, we should have some questions. Yeah, so let's just not talk about this and finish here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> or maybe it'll come up in the conversation. Yeah. Perhaps it can come up in the Q and A. Um, does anybody have any questions? Actually, I'm curious about becoming American. Oh God. Okay. All right. The quick and dirty version. I mean, Anya knows. I can just talk forever. Um to tell this very succinctly. In January 2020, I was invited to participate in the Whitney Biennial, which was supposed to be take place in 2021. My first site visit was scheduled for March 13, 2020, which is the day New York shut down. So I had to evacuate New York and go back to California. In June 2020, I got married and started the process of becoming a lawful permanent resident of the U.S., which is otherwise known as applying for a green card. And during that time, I had been kind of thinking of possible projects to propose for the biennial. And uh, during, um, I mean, I have to say that, the, you know, that kind of lawful permanent residence process is a very bureaucratic process. But while I was doing it, I was like, but this is also kind of a philosophical one. It's a conceptual one. Like, what does it mean to change your status? So I kind of had been kind of haunted by that, by kind of, relocating to the states almost permanently, like what does it mean to not only look at the world from this side of the world, but also what does it do to me or to one as one changes technically status. And that's when I came across a really interesting set of documents, which is the naturalization test. So the end process of the process that I've started, if somebody wants to become a United States citizen, the last thing you do before taking the Pledge of Allegiance is um, to take an exam, uh, which is you have to learn 100 questions about US um, government, geography, and civics. You have to, uh, you're asked 10 questions, and you have to answer six correctly. 
and then you have to be able to read and write one sentence out of three in English. So the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services provides study guides for these, so you go to the exam knowing all the questions and all the answers. Uh, but you also, and so for, and for the English component, you go not knowing the sentences, but knowing every single word that can be in that sentence. And so the proposal for the biennial was to, and so when you look, when one looks at these, at these questions, they quickly become, if you take them out of the context of this exam, they again become very strange and very contradictory and very telling of a type of history uh, that's either um, skewed in one direction, but it also kind of opens up all these questions about citizenship, citizenry, civics, um, these, you know, also for the most part are questions that de facto citizens cannot answer. And so I was kind of like interested in that and in confronting that with, um, uh, again, I was really interested, sorry, in doing a project that would take over the Whitney Museum building and not be primarily in the exhibition spaces. So I was interested in, in spaces that are not usually used for the display of art. So corridors, hallways, facades, bathrooms, elevators, stairwells. And so the project was to actually distribute uh, 35 of the 100 questions across the building, um, kind of using the same font and a kind of signage that the design department at the Whitney kind of uses. So it kind of embeds itself uh, within the, the logic of the building. I kind of use the word insidious as a kind of a keyword to think about this project. And it kind of, it comes across on the facade, on stairwells, like I said, on um, uh, windows, above fountains, and it kind of just lifts certain questions, kind of puts them out there, leaves you without the answer, and for the most part, without any clues as if this is even a work. So my name is nowhere, there's, you know, it's very kind of open, let's say, as a process. The second component of this work is a four-channel video that was actually in one of the floors of the, of the biennial, which just basically runs every couple of seconds one of the 100 words that you have to learn in order to kind of pass the writing and, and reading component of this project and kind of transforms these words into kind of this almost nonsensical concrete poem, haiku, kind of crazy reflection of, of the absurdity of everything, I guess. And I, the last component of this work was also kind of thinking about it not only in the physical space, but a version of it on the, basically, in the, in the digital sphere. And so for the run of the biennial, we kind of slightly redesigned the Whitney's website so that under the main leaderboard, these kind of questions uh, would, would run and they kind of follow you as you go through the, through the, the museum's website. And only if you click on one of them will the whole kind of project be kind of explained, let's say, or released to you. Um, and then at the bottom of this page, actually, it links, it takes you out of the Whitney's website and takes you to the United States Immigration and, um, Services. So it kind of moves you from one type of institution into another. And the last component, which is basically a takeover of the Whitney's Instagram page. So every two weeks for the run of the biennial, we kind of ran these mock citizenship exams. So 10 questions were asked um, every two weeks through the kind of social media channel of the, of the museum. The comments were very strange. Um, so yeah, that's the low and dirty of that. All right, next question. <laughs> Say between 
preparing for this talk, you know, it's kind of, when I'm doing these projects, I'm like, I'm inside of them, so it's very hard to think of them as actually part of a larger kind of project that kind of brings them together, but it's kind of when I do these exercises of preparing slides for this thing, I was like, oh, it kind of, these works kind of like speak to each other in a way, and I think together they form a body that I have yet to define, <laughs> which is, I think, the easiest way for me at this moment to think about it is this, you know, history through kind of objects, right? But also kind of the, these, taking these processes almost, in a way there's something very literal about a lot of these um, gestures, let's say, or a lot of this kind of impulse, right? There's something almost, to the degree where sometimes it can fall into the like one-liner, right? But like the potential maybe of a series of one-liners to kind of accumulate and then create something else, right? So a lot of times when I think of these pieces in isolation, you know, they there's something almost kind of... They're both very, let's say, flat and very deep. Right? And so it's like I'm always kind of contending with the tension between those. And so it's interesting to me that when I start thinking of them as an accumulation of gestures, right, they create this, again, parallel maybe world to the one that I kind of inhabit and walk through, right? So it's kind of thinking, I don't know if that answers your question, but like, yeah, it's kind of, it's in these moments that I was like, oh, that kind of makes sense together, maybe. Can I follow up about flatness and depth? Um, what just struck me, all the stories you're telling are so effective, um, or deeply effective on an emotional register. How do you think about um, you know, that flattening, like through abstraction or minimal sculpture? Is that like a necessary part of the process to kind of empty something out and yeah. strip it to kind of yeah. Effective material. Like, do yeah. you do you think on some other um, level in terms of almost like a spiritual process to like re-imbue an object, not even like an a quote unquote authentic object, but it's like oftentimes a facsimile or recreation. Um, like imbue it with almost like a talismanic mm -hmm. power in mm -hmm. a way. Like you talked, you, you mentioned the words like exorcism or, or touching these objects with your hands. Um, it's almost as if it can't have like a relationship to an actual site that you have to almost reconfigure it to be like anti-site specific in a way. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean it's, uh, you know, so there's a couple of things. One is that I kind of, I always have to contend with how much to tell, right? Like how much to disclose. Um, because for example, a lot of the things that I shared with you tonight are in most cases, absent in the exhibition space. Um, and that is very intentional because I think um, part of the kind of the challenge is precisely that, that we encounter things that were made for reasons that have nothing to do with the world in which we operate, that were made for audiences or people that are long gone, and yet these objects still reverberate something to us, right? And so if we're always kind of caught in the specificity of a particular history associated with a thing, then in a way that thing is never allowed to exist without that story. And so in a way I feel like I always have to do that exercise to my own self, which is to say, 
that yes, a lot of these objects kind of are reflections of very particular and specific encounters and stories. But what happened what happened if I treat the things that I'm making as if I'm a stranger to them, right? And I'm a stranger even to their own story, which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't, right? Like there's moments where like too much editing or too much abstraction becomes purely, let's say, formal. Sometimes when it's the other way, when, I'm, when I try to tell a lot of things, it kind of becomes more, let's say, um, again, like it's a, it's a good joke, it's a good story, but is it a good work? You know, like it's kind of that balancing act I think a lot of time gets, um, I don't know if it gets resolved, or it, for me it kind of gets quieted down when I yeah, focus on what I would say like the material, right? Or focus on thinking about creating a space of encounter where also you as a viewer have the possibility to imagine yourself within that work and with that work, right? For me, the the trouble sometimes of oversharing is that in a way the story takes over the experience, right? And so how can you create a condition where also the part of the experience, a large part in my opinion of the experience, is completely out of my control, right? And not it should be out of my control. And so in a way how to relinquish that control while at the same time being... Um, yeah, open to the, the, the power of the story and its specificity, right? So that's when I, th I always kind of uh, go back to, I think there's like a big shift that happened for me in uh, working closely with these archaeologists and in working particularly with uh, people that have to care for objects for whom that do not belong in their reality, that in a way to kind of really think about the talismanic potential, the reverberating, echoing potential of things way beyond, uh, again, their original kind of intention. So it's like I kind of find myself in recent years having to, again, find ways to distance yeah, myself from my own self, weirdly enough, to be able to kind of also think of those works. I mean, does that make sense? Yeah. And I always, I always kind of say that I'm not at the center. The object, the work is at the center of the inquiry. I'm not at the center of the inquiry with the object. I feel like me as, a, as an artist, uh, an audience member, a curator, a writer, a collector, a, we kind of together kind of form this world around this this kind of object. And so by trying to sometimes distance myself from the thing is also an attempt for allowing space for interpretation and also allowing space for the object to transform. Which, like, for example, like whenever I see the steel ring piece, which is ultimately a rather, like, simple gesture, and see how certain... Uh, or again, writers or curators envision it in certain locations that not only I would have never imagined, but it's a, I, I look at, sometimes I look at these works and they're new even to me, right? So it's kind of like there are these kind of estrangement principles and kind of thinking of estrangement as a, a guiding force in, in making work. That sounds very deep, yeah. Uh, <laughs> presentation. It was beautiful. Um, I found myself very inspired from the things that you showed. So I come from more of a photography background, but um, this kind of work interests me greatly. And I'm interested in, so it may sound like an ignorant question, but the, the production of this sort of work that is research driven and um, ambitious in scope, what does that look like in terms of the production of this? Are you always working in partnership with another organization that potentially helps bring this to life, or is it um, all you? Yeah, I mean, it, it's... Uh it's been very interesting. I think I'm very stubborn, and I think stubborn. stubbornness is essential to making a lot of these projects happen. Uh, 
it, it definitely is the result of a lot of partnership, also a lot of, um, uh, I mean, we can, I can answer it on many levels. I can answer it kind of very pragmatically, like how to make these works happen, which are the result of, uh, yeah, a lot of um, uh, help in production, uh, support, financial support from certain institutions uh, for the making of these works. They're also, I would say, the result of, yeah, kind of these partners within specific places that are willing to take on uh, some of these stories that might be challenging. So, for example, like, when I approached the, the Kim Benzel at, at the Met, uh, the approach was not like, I want to do, like, a show at the Met, right? Like, it, again, sometimes the way in which uh, you approach a place uh, sets the tone for the engagement. So particularly with the Fragments project, I figured out early on that if I didn't tell people I was an artist, it would actually get me further in the conversation. So basically really leaning into the, this personal story and just say, I just have nine photos that I'd like to sit down for an hour and talk to you about. And then depending on the reaction, then the stubbornness kicks in, and I'm like, oh, can I meet you again? And let's talk about this other thing. Certainly, like the British Museum, they're like, absolutely not, we don't even want to talk to you. Great. You know, the Pergamon was like, fine, we'll talk to you for like three times, and then you want to make the rubbings perfect, go home. The, the Met was like, okay, what's next, right? So it was like, first, a conversation about the photos. Then I was like, actually, I'm working on this performance which is a guided tour. Can I just give a guided tour at the Met in front of those four objects, you know, to a group of 20 people? She was like, actually, yes, it's not a lot of resources. It's not. Then I was like, okay, can I make rubbings of these objects? Then I was like, oh, maybe we can work on a show together. You know, so it's kind of like this additive process. That's why I think like sometimes also, I like, I trust time, like I'm, Weirdly enough, not in a rush, which is why I have to work on multiple projects at all times, because they're in different states. Because a lot of times, I mean, right now this all looks, you know, polished and really beautiful and kind of comes together, but it is the result of accidents, mostly. It is the results of anecdotes, side conversation. That's why I usually don't say that I'm kind of like a research-based practice. I don't fact-check anything. I don't, I failed all my theory classes. I don't know a lot of the, you know, texts that are, people are supposed to know. Not for, like, uh, I just, I just can't process the world that way. But I really believe in the power of an accident and the power of a side conversation to come in and kind of turn everything. And that sometimes you just have to wait. So for example, had I, I mean, I learned that three years into working with the team at the Met, that had I sent that email a week before I sent it, the department was under the direction of somebody else and they would have just said no. And a lot of this would not have happened. So it's also finding, I would say, allies in certain either institutions or, again, that's why I, th I really think a lot of, like, and think really highly of curators, of writers, of, like, the audience. Sometimes a work changes based on a reaction of an audience member, right? Like, it's kind of being open to that. And I really, yeah, go back to, like, just stubbornness. Like, I just, like, you know, sometimes when I just get something in my head, I just, will find a way to make it happen. Quick follow-up to that. In the case of the piece with the steel rings, mm -hmm. or the piece with the uh, boat made out of cypress, was that more so having someone believe in the idea to help bring that into fruition? Yeah, I mean, steel rings is, is, is kind of interesting because it really started with, like, one ring. I just had, like, I, I have a vision for all 1,213 pieces. I know where they go, I have it in my mind. I'm not there yet. But I knew that I had to start with like a slice, like basically a slice, rather than starting with a cake, I start with a slice. And so I was like, okay, I can produce with my own money 
one of these rings. And I was like, I think I can have a conversation with somebody and one of these things. And somehow, like in a weird like traveling salesman energy, convinced them that maybe we should make five together. And then maybe we should make 10. And then maybe we should make 60. And then one day we'll make all of them. So in that, it's kind of this weird, and, and that also, for example, in this case, enters the logic of the dissemination of this work. So for example, this piece is also sold in pieces, right? So it's a work that, you know, even though it kind of comes across as this kind of massive kind of sculptural gesture, it's actually consumed in parts. And that, that's also this kind of moment where I realized that what if some of those works could help fund others in a very kind of basic kind of b business strategy that like in order to do the boat, I need to like make a certain number of rings. The boat piece also was, I mean, that is definitely the result of the belief of, of um, a particular curator in the power of that story and the fact that, yeah, I was able to get this boat and store it for three years on, you know, in the north of Lebanon because I had a friend who had a land that was unused that I can just put this thing in it and then as it waited for its own, not only for it to be shown, I think as it waited for me to know what to do with it because some of those stories also, I kind of come across them and they're too big. They're too big not just in terms of scope, they're just too big to deal with and I need that kind of distance, right? Like, I need to make this boat no longer about my family's failed attempt, which took me three years to realize that actually now when I look at this boat, I only look at, like, physics, right? And weight and transference and, for, you know, so it's, like, both that, right? So it's kind of, right? Did that, does that make sense? Yeah, thank you for answering that because sometimes the biggest thing is, like, barriers to entry. It's, like, how does this... So yeah. Are you sharing that? That was, like, worth its weight in gold, yeah. so and I also think it's, 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 again, in the traveling salesman attitude, a lot of these work, I mean, not the boat, but, like, a lot of these works, you, I can, like, store them in a box, right? And then I can go to a place, and they're like, I was like, if you give me a room, I can fill it. If you give me a museum, I can fill it with the same things, right? And so it's kind of that attitude that sometimes get these specific works, which now come across as rather, let's say, massive, but when you take them apart, they're actually quite um, intimate, for lack of a better word, and for me, that's a very important part of the work, that there's, you know, there's this intimacy that remains at the core of the practice.